Hello, I'm V, and I'm a watercolour artist, and welcome to the Visual Illiterate. Let me show you what I've been working on. I've been developing the Chinese Zodiac series for a few years now, and this one is Year of the Pig. The mother pig is practically dancing with mirth in the spring sunshine. This piglet is bursting through a curtain of willow leaves. We have some happy daffodils over here, a sprightly piglet chasing a dragonfly down there. Yeah, I just have to clean up some lines, add a few more daffodil leaves, and then I can make it to the fun part, painting this piece. <laughs> you can't tell, but inwardly I am bursting with relief because designing the composition for this piece has been unusually trying. And for a while, I had a sinking feeling that I may never make it to the painting stage. I'm not exaggerating when I say I reworked the sketch some 20 times, so much so that I actually ruined a sheet of watercolour paper. <laughs> I just kept moving things around, taking out a pair of birds, replacing plants, adding a pond, waking a piglet up from a nap, turning butterflies into dragonflies, so on and so forth. I stopped tweaking a composition when, I swear, I hear a click. Like many gears locking into place. And as I was going through all these different compositions, I could not hear that click. Until at last I did, with this composition. Now, I feel like I can finally lift my head up again and see beyond the borders of this sheet of paper, and even make a video for you without looking insane. <laughs> because I certainly felt a bit insane and ridiculous too, as one does when one is miserably stuck. I had to keep reminding myself that every painting I make has its own temperament, its own rate of growth, its own elusive set of needs that I somehow have to meet. <laughs> Sometimes a painting comes together and sort of ripens overnight, and other times, like this one, it takes its fine, luxurious time. In times like these, especially when an artwork is still nascent, I have to resist the urge to rush it, to force it, to contort it into something that it does not want to be. Because I've made that mistake before, more times than I would like, and it has never ended well. I've come to view my role as an artist as helping art reveal itself, and that every painting that I've ever made has been a collaboration between art providing the seed of inspiration, and me, putting in the labour to assist it to grow and materialise. So, <laughs> as frustrated as I can be with art, I know that art is a friend, and certainly not mine to boss around. <laughs> now, Onto the main business for today. In this episode of If Paintings Could Speak, I will talk about the first painting that I did for the Chinese Zodiac series, and it's this one. Let me get it. This is so big. Year of the Monkey. I feel 
feel like I'm being dwarfed by this painting. Uh, well, hello again. I'll walk you through the painting. The monkey depicted here is called the Spectacled Langer because they have white discs around their eyes that look like round rimmed spectacles set against the face of black fur. I was especially surprised by the contrast between fully grown spectacled langers who aren't purplish blue like I've painted here, but a mix of greys and blacks and their golden, luminous babies. I knew I had to paint them because that colour contrast was just too absurd and fetching to pass up. And they made me smile. As you can see, the mother langer has a more sober, knowing, determined look, fitting for the wise and the spectacled as she contemplates the old year past and the new year ahead. On the other hand, the baby languor beams with a full face of sunshine and innocence. Here's a note on colour. Red and gold are deemed auspicious colours, whereas black is definitely not. While the baby languor was a perfect nod to the traditional taste for gold, I did have to take some artistic license when it came to the mother langer. Flanking the langers are peonies, so well loved in Chinese culture for their grand and stately appearance, that they have been crowned the king of flowers. Reaching full bloom in spring, peonies are thought to bring blossoming wealth and blessing. Fluttering onto the scene are butterflies who aren't there just for show. You see, many Chinese motifs acquire their significance owing to puns. In this case, the word for butterfly is hu die, and the word for good luck and fortune is fu. Since hu sounds like fu, Butterflies have thus become the bearers of good luck and fortune. <laughs> I made sure to depict the butterflies as arriving into the painting because obviously it seems like poor judgement to have the bearers of good luck and fortune fly away. In the background is a lattice made up of the Chinese character for spring. It's custom to write that Chinese character on a piece of red paper to paste on your front door, but upside down. That could be explained once again by puns. The word for upside down is dao, and the word for arrive is dao. So, by pasting the word for spring upside down means that spring has arrived. Oh, and I incorporated the symbol for money into the Chinese character for spring. Old Chinese coins used to have holes in the centre to allow you to string your coins together to fasten about your waist for you to carry about. If you look at the lattice of springs diagonally, you'll notice that the coins are rotating because the square hole in the centre changes from square to diamond to square to diamond and so on. And that was my subtle way of showing wealth cascading into the painting. <laughs> Moreover, I designed the character for spring to look like a flower, just to make the butterflies happy. <laughs> To put it simply, the Chinese Zodiac series was my attempt to reimagine and modernise the traditional Chinese New Year aesthetic, the one that harmonises cultural tradition with the vibrancy and the delicacy of spring.
So that was a description of what this painting is about. And no doubt some of you will have spotted some of the motifs and their meanings without my explaining them. However, what you cannot know just by looking at the painting alone are the stories hidden within. When I look at the painting, it takes me back to the beginning of 2016, when I was still caught in my early years as an artist and feeling perplexed as to which direction I ought to take my art. I had spent the better part of the year before throwing myself into intensely personal paintings that were in essence, a visual diary of my turbulent emotions. Back then, I was so desperate to make something out of my art that, as a result, I perpetually felt like I was failing, left and right and all over the place. So, 2015 became the year of confronting, but also comforting those fraught emotions. During that time, my world turned blue. So my paintings turned blue. That self-investigation turned out to be invaluable, yet absolutely exhausting. <laughs> Entering into 2016, I knew that I needed a break from that kind of art and turn my attention outwards. Which led me to wonder, well, what do I paint now? I soon found out that others around me had much to say on the matter. First came the comments. So all your paintings are blue, huh? Your paintings look sad and depressing. Then came the advice. Perhaps you should switch up your colour palette. All your paintings are starting to look the same. Portraits are a bit scary. How about painting more animals? People like paintings that make them happy. Do something cute and colourful. Perhaps you should paint a more popular subject matter. Something instantly relatable. Your paintings require too much explanation. You are asking too much of your viewers. Think advertisements. Now, I am not decrying those suggestions because they were fair and well intended. But I lacked confidence back then and everything stung. This sudden influx of advice all seeming to say, paint anything but what you've been doing had the strange effect of alienating me from myself. All of a sudden, I felt like I couldn't depend on myself to make good decisions. Finding myself in a bit of a pickle, as usual, I try to write my way out of it. And here, are the notes that I made in the beginning of 2016. And I've copied some of the excerpts into this lovely notebook to share with you. In this first excerpt, you'll see my initial and more emotional <laughs> response to the problem. Mm. No, I do not regret having painted those blue paintings. They were paintings born out of a need 
reflections of my soul, searching, grasping, trying to outlive the poison of so much doubt, contempt, fury, bitterness. The paintings gave me the space to meet them, these rejected scraps of myself I had repeatedly shunned. And in this space, I experienced not just how to exist with them, but how to reach out and cradle my panic, soothe my clutter of crying inadequacies. I know those paintings intimately, the meaning of every symbol, the reason for every detail. I know those paintings by heart. However, it's one thing to connect with a painting personally, and quite another to view it through other people's eyes. I've recently been honoured with the awkwardness of witnessing what is precious to me be perceived as blah. Did I expect understanding? Certainly not. Had I hoped for a morsel of interest, just enough to see through the blueness, perhaps even detect a story arc of growth? Why, stupidly, yes. Something needs to change, and by that, choices have to be made. I do not regret the choices I have made. But as I squint my eyes to try to make out what lies ahead, I mistrust the choices I have yet to make. <laughs> After giving myself a few days to feel less weird about the situation, I try to tackle this problem again. And in the second excerpt, you'll see a more level-headed attempt at trying to understand my problem. Oops, okay. Here's what I know to be true. An openness to critique can point to shortcomings that you may otherwise miss recommend realms of knowledge that you may otherwise walk past, propel actions that you may otherwise have left unstirred. The breadth of your perspective positively correlates with the breadth of your imagination, spirit and learning. Here's what I also know to be true. Self-knowledge is the spine that allows you to stand upright amidst the winds of public opinion, built from the vertebrae of knowing what fits you, what challenges you, what sings to you, what you hold dear, what you nurture, what you grow, what you protect, what sets you free, and what you let go. Without it, you end up flirting with one trendy notion after another, always fashionable, but without personal style. Here is my conundrum. I do not know which side to lean into right now. If I take the advice of others in bulk, does that make me an adventurous spirit trekking new ground, or a blade of grass bending to whichever direction the wind blows. However, should I reject the advice, how can I be certain if my rejection is based on knowledge of myself, as opposed to an unconscious bias for something familiar, fear of the unknown, laziness to exert myself. Where's the line? When does open-mindedness cross over into gross pandering? When does staying true to yourself 
cross over into stubbornness, ossified. <laughs> Eventually, I realised that my writing was doing a fine job expanding my problem, but doing very little to actually helping me solve it. So, I decided I should just pick a side, assume it's right, go with it, let my actions play out and see where they take me. I figured since I've already spent a year creating personal pieces, now was the time to shake things up and try something new. Chinese New Year of the Monkey was just two weeks away, and if I could paint this popular subject as a colourful cartoon, then I would be ticking all the boxes of what others wanted to see from my art. So, I got down to work. I remember approaching this painting almost like a paint by numbers, because I was keenly aware of this list of things that I needed to fulfil. When Year of the Monkey arrived, a painting was complete. No, not this one, but this one. I still can't quite believe that I am showing you this painting. <laughs> I remember I was so confused by the outcome of this painting because I would sort of like it in one moment and then hate it in the next. Reaching for my notebook again to share with you some of the notes that I scrawled down after finishing this painting. This painting has all the elements of what I had set out to do. It has a clear subject with popular appeal. It has colour. It is festive. The monkeys all have big heads with big smiles and small round bodies, as cute cartoon characters do. Staring at this piece, I see that, technically, everything pretty much went according to plan. But good grief, does this painting look wrong? I swear, I'm getting that feeling I do when I come across a Hello Kitty knockoff and notice that her eyes are slightly too close together and her torso is a tad too long. <laughs> when I finally resigned myself to the fact that this painting did not go well, I jotted down these few lines. This is why I trust art. Art will not lie to me, nor will it take any of my lies, even if those lies are served on a colourful platter and all dressed up in sweet smiles and pretty eyes. This next excerpt gets at what went wrong in my approach. I think I engaged only in my brain for this painting. I drew plans, set parameters, laid out goals and made a point to leave my soul to hang on a cage rack because it wouldn't stop nagging. Making this painting feels like I had carefully made a nest of tinder, framed it with kindling, stacked on the firewood and in the last step, forgot the match. I didn't bring the fire, so what I made couldn't catch light.
I didn't bring the fire. That stuck with me because it showed me that the problem wasn't with the advice that I received. The problem was with how I acted on that advice and I had a bad take. When I accepted the advice of others, I accepted it without tailoring it to fit me. Instead, I forced myself to fit the advice, despite recognizing that it wasn't resonating with me emotionally, nor was it inspiring me artistically. What was missing was a larger unifying idea on which to hang these different suggestions. And that missing piece could only come from me. And it could only come from that part of me that harbours genuine curiosity, honesty and delight. And I could only access that part of me by giving it a voice. And that voice was the first thing I shut up when I started this painting. <laughs> I jotted down the sentence on a post-it. Whatever words I receive from others, I have to first listen to those words, then restate them in my own voice, and finally, add to them words of my own. <laughs> I remember sitting there and feeling like this was quite the revelation, albeit an embarrassingly obvious one. <laughs> As I was pondering the sentence, thinking how I could apply it to future projects and how it would have changed the outcome of some of my past endeavours, I was surprised to find that I already knew how to do this as a student without even realising it. Back in school, there were numerous times when I was handed art assignments that I considered to be quite dumb and dull. <laughs> but that was rarely a problem because I instinctively pivoted every prompt towards my interests and made that prompt my own, with or without approval from my teachers. As a result, I usually ended up with something that I liked and enjoyed making. I elaborate on this change in my temperament here in this excerpt. It is strange to be reminded of the fiery and confident artist I was as a student. I had authority figures to work off of then, be it working with or against them. My teachers would nonetheless stand like walls I could throw ideas on. Judging by how those ideas bounced back, I could not only make decisions quickly, but also stand by them firmly. However, now that I am the authority who is calling the shots, I am stuck in this weird position of having to objectively critique my work and fervently support my creative whims. Wearing this new coat of authority has biased me towards giving its opinions much more credence than my artistic voice. The more deference I paid to the critic, the more strident and dominant the critic became, and the less I knew how to support the artist. Moreover, I suspect that my inner critic has become the most miserable kind of authority slow to give clear direction, yet keen to rebuke. The result has been a creative process marred by infighting, as I kept doubting every instinct I had, trying to justify every bend in my reasoning, thereby eroding impulse 
spontaneity, exuberance into overwrought examination. Still, there's a need for the critic. The critic is the one that gets to say, you should have used better kindling. You could have arranged the firewood in a different structure. But it is up to the artist to bring the fire. By the time I had realised, well, all of this, <laughs> Chinese New Year had long come and gone. But I was like, this cartoon painting cannot be my final answer to this challenge. I have to try again. This time, I'll express the Chinese zodiac in my artistic voice. This shift in mentality was like sunlight pouring into a dark, damp room, revealing dust-covered feelings, thoughts, and memories. The first feeling to arrive was just how much I adore spring. It's my favourite season. I can Feel the land awakening, see fresh pastel colours returning, and there's a gentleness, a sweetness in the air, mingled with this underlying trill of new life. Then came my fascination for wildlife. I've always found the dignity, charm, and resilience of animals to be a constant source of wonder. So I saw this painting as an opportunity to spend a few merry afternoons reading about different species of monkeys. Oh, and the structure of a butterfly wing. <laughs> Soon, my childhood memories of celebrating Chinese New Year emerged. And I recalled with a few chuckles just how unnerved I was as a child by the festivities because my senses were so overwhelmed. Firecrackers crackling like whiplashes, incense smoke rising and stinging my eyes and my nose, temples swarming with people, red decorations that were too red and gold that shone of plastic. There were times when my little self would escape to a corner of a room, wishing, why can't we just all sit under a tree and look at a flower or some birds, please? <laughs> ah. However, weaving its way through these childhood memories, was a thread of newfound interest in the history, significance, and mythology of Chinese New Year, an appreciation that I gradually acquired later in life. Last but not least, coursing through these different layers of ideas was a distinct desire to harmonize tradition with nature in a fashion that honours both. And just like that, I was eager and ready to make this new painting. Of course, during its making, I still had my moments of, what am I doing? Should I do this? Ooh, why did I do that? <laughs> Nevertheless, I was reassured by the knowledge that I started this painting from a good place. So no matter what happens to this piece, it would never feel 
vacant or lifeless or alien to me. That is the sentiment I still hold on to for all the paintings I have made since then. <laughs> Reading my notes from 2016, not just the excerpts that I've shared with you, but the stack of notes that I showed you earlier, what jumped out at me the most was what a lack of confidence did to me. The most prominent of which was how swiftly it narrowed my vision. That narrowing of my vision meant I would mistake for clarity what was in fact rigidity in my thinking. So when I was presented with bad options, I would trap myself into believing that I had to pick a side or I had to choose the option least bad. <laughs> I think a key difference between who I was then and who I am now is that now I can look at bad options and have the confidence to say, no, thank you. But none of these will do. And that's okay because I will come up with something better. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for watching the second episode of If Paintings Could Speak. Here's to you living artistically, and I'll see you next time. Bye! Bye! Oh, you grumpy little thing. You grumpy little thing. <laughs>